aspartame, better known as the artificial sweetener used in Diet Coke. And one of the most common artificial sweeteners out there is going to be added to the World Health Organization's naughty list and declared a possible carcinogen to humans this month. That's July, 2023, if you're watching this in the future. More specifically, it's going to be added to the list by the International Agency for Research on Cancer or the IARC, who does the research things for the World Health Organization. So in the video, I'll reference the IARC a bunch, but just know the IARC and the World Health Organization or the WHO, for the purposes of today's video, they're the same thing. So what does this mean? Can we still drink our beloved Diet Coke? Should you hurl equal packets away from you and off of your tables in restaurants? The news headlines are giving absolute panic. So how panicked are we? I'll tell you, but first we must have a quick visit to Liz in the billing department. Hello there, welcome to Billing. I'm Billing Liz, and today I'd like to spend our two minutes telling you about our sponsor for today's video, an awesome resource for NPs and PAs who are feeling overwhelmed with the insane amount of things that you need to know in primary care. What are you hoping to accomplish in this meeting? <laughs> Do you see what I did there? I was setting intentions with clear expectations for the appointment. I learned this in the primary care bootcamp for NPs and PAs from PrimeMed. It's one of the methods that's supposed to help keep your day and your appointments on track. I learned it in the prioritizing issues in short office visits lecture. They have all sorts of classes in this bootcamp. It's targeted for NPs and PAs in primary care to help build confidence in managing acute and chronic conditions, triaging patients to higher levels of care, interpreting labs and navigating clinical practice just in general. All of the lessons are from experienced advanced practice providers who want to share their expertise with you now that they've figured it out a little bit. When you buy the bundle, you get one year of unlimited access to over 20 hours of on-demand learning and and downloadable content for reference on the go. The videos are short and focused on chief complaints, making them easier to digest and apply to your clinical practice. Topics in this are going to range from how do I work up back pain, tips for a successful annual physical, all the way through things like navigating difficult patient encounters, and all of the classes count towards continuing education if you need them, which also means good news. You can use your CEU allowance to buy the course if you have that available. They even threw in a class on billing, which you know I appreciate. Liz desperately needs to take that one because big yikes. Uh, we'll never understand why they don't teach more of that in school. It makes my life interesting. Anywho, this is a lovely collection of knowledge. Look at all of the topics that are covered, making it an awesome reference tool and refresher for those entering primary care for the first time, or for those just looking to gain some extra confidence, no matter how many years you've been doing it. I will leave a link for you down below in case you would like to check it out. And if you use the code Liz10, you'll get 10% off. This was indeed a quick appointment. Uh, so do you have any questions? No? Well, let me know if you do down below in the comments and I will see you later. Bye for now. All right, now back to how panicked are we? Yeah, um, we're not. At least I'm not, you can't be. But here's what the warning possible carcinogen to humans actually means. So the IARC, the cancer research people for the World Health Organization, they have this list, the naughty list of things that can maybe cause humans to get cancer. There are five groups that they put all of these things into. Group one is most likely to cause cancer and has the strongest evidence to do so behind it. And let's start there. Group one products on the naughty list have been found to be carcinogenic in humans. We should probably define carcinogenic real quick because we're going to be using that word 8 million times today. The IARC gives 10 key characteristics of carcinogens. I'll leave them on the screen if you wanna nerd out, but essentially it means a carcinogen is something that could cause cancer in humans. So the naughtiest of the items that are looked into on this list are put in group one. To land a group one label, there has to be sufficient evidence for the potential cause of cancer in a human, or something can land on this group if there has been evidence that the item is linked to cancer in animals, and there is strong evidence that it might affect human cells the same way. It doesn't actually have to have given a human cancer. And that's something I think is important to note here. It can just be found in animal studies and end up in group one. Also important to note with the whole list, the dose of the exposure is not taken into account at all. So for any category, you may need to be exposed to something a million times to be at risk of cancer. But if they find that one in a million chance of cancer, then they can back it up and put it on the list because dose like I said, is not factored in at all. The only thing they look at is, can this maybe cause cancer? 
And that's it. There is a lot of nuance to this list that leaves the door wide open for news articles to make it look way scarier than it is without actually looking at the real research, which is kind of what has happened here. But it ends. It ends today. I will defend my Diet Coke till my last breath. Anywho, here's a few items that are in the group one category. Remember that these items have been found to be potentially causing cancer. Alcoholic beverages, the consumption of processed meats, UV tanning beds, asbestos, and tobacco. I will leave a link to the whole list in the description so you can browse. There's a lot of chemicals with very long names, which I am not, I'm not about to try to say those. So you can look through the list if you want and see if you also are, are sitting here going alcohol and processed meats. Uh, I have had both today. That's not a good sign. Moderation, I'm telling myself, is everything. <laughs> Also, I probably should look into that. But for now, we move on. Group 2A, moving down the ladder in terms of cancer risk. Items in the 2A category probably have the potential to cause cancer in humans. And to get on this list, you need two limited source of evidence that it caused cancer in humans, or two sufficient sources of evidence that it caused cancer in experimental animals, or three forms of strong evidence that it causes mutation in human cells or tissues. I apologize also for the quality of this chart. <laughs> Why you would put this image over another image and not like fade it more or blur it is beyond me, but I guess uh, PowerPoint skills are not like super high on the job prerequisites <laughs> for working at the IARC. But here is what the who thinks would probably give you cancer on this 2A list. We have hot beverages that are over 65 Celsius or 149 Fahrenheit, and that's, that's quite warm. Uh, I enjoy my coffee like really hot and my perfect temperature is 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which I only know because I have an ember mug. <laughs> Shout out to that thing for being my favorite like work from home companion. Uh, put it on your gift list, seriously. Not sponsored, but that's excellent. If you work from home, you need an ember mug. So 149 is like quite scalding. It probably like melts your DNA, which sounds like it could cause cancer. It makes sense to me. Uh, night shift work is also on the list. Did that for six years. So that's like not the news that I really wanted to hear here. And the consumption of red meat also made this category. I didn't like this category very much. Uh, I felt very called out. So moving on. Group 2B. This group possibly has the potential to cause cancer in humans. So we've moved from probably causes cancer to potentially causes cancer. To land in this category, you need less evidence to back it up. So you need one source of limited evidence that the cancer is caused in humans, or one source of sufficient evidence that it caused cancer in an experimental animal, or one strong point of evidence that it caused human cell or tissue mutation. Things on this list are aloe vera, radio frequency waves given off from cell phones, um, doing carpentry, consuming pickled vegetables, and medications like metronidazole, commonly given for yeast infections, and phenobarbital, an anti-seizure medication. And this group, group 2B, is where the IARC is planning on putting our beloved aspartame. So right off the bat, we are lower down, right, on the list. Aspartame may possibly cause cancer, but the evidence does not need to be robust or even in humans in order for this to be classified classified here. So what kind of data did they even use to put it on the list in the first place? Animal studies. There are studies out there that show when given massive doses of aspartame, experimental animals got cancer, but the amount of aspartame that they received was absurd. Rats were fed between 20 and 500 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of aspartame. And they found more leukemia in the rats with the aspartame versus the aspartame free animals. In humans, after decades of research, it's been recommended that the safe daily intake of aspartame be a max 50 milligrams per kilogram of body weight of aspartame a day. And remember in the study, the rats were given up to 500 milligrams per kilogram. And in humans, let's say you weigh like 140 pounds. In order to hit the acceptable daily intake of aspartame, you'd need to drink 16 cans of Diet Coke. And that's still deemed like acceptable and safe. So the rats in the study, first of all, they're not human, but if they were, they were being given the equivalent of 160 Diet Cokes worth of aspartame a day, every day. And then they had more cancer. And honestly, I'm just impressed at that point that they were alive. Too much of anything is going to cause wacky things to happen in the body. Again, moderation here 
is key. And this is why the whole dose thing not being discussed on the list becomes an issue, right? Because obviously most people are not going around and drinking 160 Diet Cokes worth of aspartame a day, and most people are not rats. So because some animal studies showed a link to cancer when they piled aspartame into rats, now this sweetener gets added to the naughty list and opens the door for all sorts of like fear mongering and false information to be spread saying aspartame causes cancer in humans. When decades of research have looked at does aspartame cause cancer in humans and absolutely no studies have been able to find a link in, to cancer in humans. Now, should they continue to research this? Yes, absolutely. We would love to see that, more research on all the things, because if there is a risk there, I would love to know. And I wanna know at what rate of exposure and like what does it cause and all, all of that. And none of this is to say that artificial sweeteners don't pose other health risks at all. That's a whole, a whole different conversation. The IARC just looks at cancer risks. Other regulatory agencies are currently looking at the overall health effects of artificial sweeteners. And maybe we can take a look at that when it comes out. But the primary thing to keep in mind with artificial sweeteners is moderation is key. And you need to make choices that align with your health goals and your unique body. Here's kind of like the very basics of what we know about artificial sweeteners as of now. They may increase your consumption of sugar. Artificial sweeteners are like 200 to 500 times sweeter than sugar per molecule. And some research has shown that consuming artificial sweeteners is associated with an increase in sugary food consumption overall, because you get used to things being really sweet and then seek out other sweeter foods. Artificial sweeteners have also been shown in some animal studies to negatively impact gut bacteria. Again, another area I really hope we get some human data on. So maybe in general, like if you already have tummy troubles or an immune system that's weakened, maybe avoid consuming artificial sweeteners, as we know that's very linked, you know, your immune system and your gut, that's all linked. I would hold off until we know more. And then the third thing we really see a lot uh, and hear about a lot with artificial sweeteners is you hear about these studies that show that artificial sweetener consumption is associated with higher rates of high blood pressure, high blood sugar, and high cholesterol. However, these studies are usually observational and not randomized control trials. And due to the study design, it's unclear if people consume artificial sweeteners because they have high blood pressure, high blood sugar, all of that, they have those diagnoses, or if it's the other way around. So we can't really look at it and say artificial sweeteners cause those diagnoses because it might very well be that the diagnoses are what's causing them to use artificial sweeteners. Like if you're told you're diabetic, you're probably going to switch to something that is sugar free. Again, I think this is gonna be a great area for future research, and I would love to see it done with a lot better methods so we can find more causality. I have a whole video that compares the different types of research and how you can quickly see if a study is like good or what the level of it is. And I'll leave it linked down below. Uh, I think it's one of the most frustrating things in this age of like, do your own research, um, is how much crappy research is out there. You can literally find a research study to back up literally any thought you have, but the research is often really flawed and poorly done and not a high level of quality. But nevertheless, it can appear really convincing when referenced by someone who's trying to sell you something or trying to scare you that they have this research article in their back pocket. So hopefully this puts your mind at ease a little bit. If you too are a Diet Coke lover and those headlines were giving you palpitations. Oh, and there's also a third category uh, to this list. I forgot to mention that earlier. And that's where things that they don't have enough evidence on go uh, coffee, <laughs> coffee, my beloved other beverage is on the list. And I honestly don't want them to investigate that because I just don't want to know. Let me know how much aspartame you consume regularly. And if it's anywhere near the 16 cans of Diet Coke allotment that you apparently can have, that just seems wild and too much, but it's fine. And remember that you are not alone. Even if you have a Diet Coke habit, you are enough. And you, my friends can do hard things. I'll see you next time. Bye.